Amen. Uh, amen. So today we're going to talk about this idea of mercy over condemnation. Uh, mercy over condemnation. And I know my titles ain't all fancy. Uh, and I told myself I'm not, I'm, I don't care about that either. Uh, but that's what we're talking about. Mercy over condemnation. And I pray that, amen, the Lord adds to all of our understanding as he will. Amen. So mercy over condemnation. So the first thing I want to do is I want to, I'm going to make myself an example. And so the thought that I have to share today is not the thought that I've been studying all week. And I had, an, I had another thought, and I thought it was from the Lord. I did, and maybe it was, and I may have messed it up. But, you know, as I started to develop this thought and study this thought and take notes and start to carve it out, I started to envision myself in a out of character that God has, has created me. And, and I saw myself just coming down real hard on sin and to the point of even ready to call people out about their sin. And just just going to go hard on sin altogether. Now, is that a problem? No, it's not. But that's not the ministry that God has given me. And though it I could be comfortable in that place, I truly can. I have to be obedient to what God has given me, and I, have, I can't be abusive with, with what he's doing as well. Me coming down on sin like that was 100% about me. I had a tough week this week um, in, 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 the, in, the, in my duty as a pastor, and I've had several conversations, and I've been watching things this week, and my heart was broken. And the way I wanted to resp respond to that was just to just, just call everybody out. I'm just disgusted. I'm tired of it. It's foolish. And it truly is foolish. Um, and that's okay. But I believe the Lord took that message from me because it wasn't from, my, from his spirit. It was what, how I wanted to respond to what he allowed me to experience this week. And it wasn't about him. And so I got another word from the Lord. And I pray that I'm prepared to be able to deliver this word. Amen. So I thank God for rebuking me. I thank God for reproving me. Amen. I thank God for his, I, I, I feel it's a gift. Repentance is a gift. I'm so glad that God got a hold of me before I went ahead in my own strength trying to preach some messages that would have potentially confused someone or caused them to be, uh, be, uh, be, a, it will be a stumbling block that the Lord took that from me. Maybe he'll give me that message back another day. Amen. It's all ready to go. <laughs> It's ready to go. Amen. But I didn't have permission to go there today, so I'll be obedient to what God has given me. Amen. So I want to talk about mercy over condemnation and really just to add some understanding about these two things um, before us all. Now, I want to look at a couple of ideas. These are not biblical definitions, nor are they Webster's or Merriam definition or any definition of a, a, a dictionary. These are just Isaac's thoughts. Um, on these, on these concepts here. One is a covenant, amen, and, and I'm going to apologize because this is hot off the press. I don't have scriptures uh, to put on the screen today, but I will be calling them out, amen, and I believe Montrese gave me the thumbs up. She'll be writing them in the chat. She says, we're okay, brother. I got you. Go ahead, brother. Amen. I'll go forth. Amen. Covenant, a contract or agreement in which there are conditions of both parties to satisfy. A covenant is a contract or agreement in which there are conditions of both parties to satisfy. Justice. In a charge against one party, the requirements of the contract will be followed as agreed. In other words, justice is when we follow the outcomes or the agreements of a covenant or contract. That's justice. You said you would do this, you did it, and you got that. That's justice. Justice was served. Amen. Judgment is the, de this is not a definition, this is just how I want to talk about it today. Judgment, determination as to whether a party has violated the contract or agreement. And so we go to a trial, there's a judge who passes a judgment. He hears one side, he hears the other side, and he has to, according to some sort of contract or legal agreement, make a decision that, judge, that justice is executed. Does that make sense? And so judgment is, is really deciding on the outcome of that Amen. And that is that. And that's the judgment that that is made. Now, I'm going to be talking about judgment today. Um, um, judgment. Amen. And so I want to I have a quick example. So 
What is judgment? And I say in his most simple idea, judgment among the saints in the church and the body of Christ. Judgment is when we declare a person's status with God, that's when we have judged them. When we say that, oh, brother, sister, or so-and-so is doing that, where they going to hell, or they in sin, or they out of God's will, or they shouldn't be doing this, or they're not good to do this, or all those things that we say, all of us, amen, that is judgment. It's not a big grandiose idea. It's fairly simple. It's when we put ourselves in the seat to determine what's, what justice is according to God's righteous contract or covenant that he's made with his people. Amen. And so that's what judgment is. Now, I do have a caveat before I go forward. There is a time and place where the saints have to exact judgment. The Bible tells us in certain scenarios, and, uh, and forgive me for not having prepared for this, but there's particular scenarios that if a person is in a particular sin and unrepentant, the Bible instructs us not to eat, eat with that person. There's different things where we have to make these decisions uh, within the body according to a person's um, unwillingness to repent that we have to make judgments. So those are necessary and those are permissible. Those are okay and those are even fruitful because we can't just be fellowshipping with any old body and we can't just be having dinner. To have dinner is to be in agreement. When, you, when, you, when we were in Texas, I told you guys a story, people invited you to dinner. It's when they came to learn about you and to be in fellowship with you to, to start a relationship with you. We can't be in relationship with sin. Amen. We can't, the Bible says we can't be friends with the world. And so having someone for dinner who is, who is, is outrightly in sin, unwilling to repent, is not wise. So the Bible tells us that we have to judge those scenarios. Now, unfortunately, that's not what we're doing, all of us, including me. That's not what we're doing. We're doing something altogether different. And it's damaging, and it can be hurtful. And that's where I'm focused at today. We're going to be talking about our little casual judgments that we make. Woo-wee! Wake up up in here. I'm talking to my kids. They're about to fall asleep. Amen. Amen. And so that's where we're going today. Amen. So all these questions arise when we start talking about judgment. Amen. Everybody wants to understand how they can participate in judgment because it's, we love drama. That's why reality shows ain't went away. Um, all these uh, series, these, they got these five and ten season long with 20 episodes. It's drama after drama after drama. We're glued in. We're locked in. We'll leave work early. Amen. We'll neglect our kids. We won't cook dinner. We'll do all these things. Amen. Because we want to be able to see this drama. Why? Amen. Because we want to judge these people and their foolishness. We want to talk about, did you see what Nisi did to so-and-so? I can't believe she did this. We love this type of stuff. Amen. Amen. And so... We have all these questions because we want to participate in calling so-and-so a sinner. We want, to, we want to say that so-and-so is no good. Amen. Now, I don't know where that comes from, and I'm not even going to deal with that today. Amen. That'll be another message, but we have that. And so let's look at the top questions that come along when we talk about judgment. Amen. Now, look, well, what about preachers and pastors that judge behind the pulpit? Now, hear me and hear me and understand. There is a difference between a man of God behind the pulpit preaching the mind of God while under the anointing and influence of the Holy Ghost. There'll be things that I potentially say or another pastor or preacher will say under the influence of the Holy Ghost, you don't have the permission to do it. The things that I might even say today, you don't have the permission to do it unless God tells you. Amen. We don't have the permission to do that. God has appointed a man at a right time. Now, this is biblically accurate. Let me go back into the Old Testament is full of books of prophecy whereby the unctioning of God's spirit, he called a man into Israel to judge them according to the foolishness and the folly and the deeds of their flesh. Now, we don't have scripture that says that some old random man or woman in Israel came up and started condemning everyone, but we have men that, and women that God appointed and raised up at a very particular time. I, don't, I can't think of any lifetime prophet. It was a particular season that God needed to do these things. And according to the spirit that, that commanded them to move, they moved, and they gave a word of correction, 
and it was righteous in the eyes of God. Amen. We need to hear. Amen. We need to know what the mind of God is. We need to understand how to apply his oracles. We need to know when we're in sin and how to get back into his grace and mercy. Amen. Hallelujah. And so you can't do the things that I do unless the Holy Ghost tells you to do it. If I say something under the spirit, don't go repeating after me. You could do yourself damage. And I have to be careful not to say something in my own strength, in my own mind, unless God tells me to do it. I just gave you the testimony of my whole other message. I couldn't deliver. It was in my strength I wanted to come down on everybody. It was according to my standard and how emotional I was and how I felt and how disappointed I was in my humanness, in my flesh. But God rebuked me and gave me another word, a word of mercy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So God is still using prophets now. A man or woman. Amen. There's many of us that God will give you a word and, and you go say something and you always know it was from God because that person says, oh, my goodness. Thank you. I didn't know that. I didn't know I shouldn't be, uh, be playing around with this. I didn't know I should be doing uh, Ouija boards and voodoo. I didn't know these things. Thank you for bringing it to my attention, my brother or sister. That's a confirmation for you that you were in God's will. Amen. That is evidence that you heard from God. But all these things but must be, everything we do must be doing according to the spirit of God. So, amen. So, so about the preacher, amen. If he's under the anointing of God, he's got to go forth. He'll judge, he'll do whatever the Lord tells him to do. It's biblical. Amen. Second question comes up. Shouldn't we correct our brother if they are in sin? <clears throat> Great question, my brother and my sister. Here we go. Did God ask you to correct them? Yes. Hello. Montrese threw her hands up. Did God ask you to correct them is my question back to you. Are you the prophet raised up for the season? Do you have the mind of God to deliver that message into that brother or sister? If so, go forth. If not, pray for that brother or sister. Do you not believe in prayer? Do you not believe that, that your prayer for me changes my outcome and changes my life? Do you not believe that your prayer for the sinner will uh, allow God to bring them repentance and allow them to respond to the calling of God? Do, do you not believe, amen, that your prayer for a brother or sister, amen, that is, that is failing in life, they're, they're habitual in their sin, do you not believe in the power of God to bring them out? Do you really think that it's you that God is calling? And I'm not saying that you're not. But what I am saying is that you should be very certain, amen, hallelujah, that God is leading you and it's not you leading yourself. It is, since the face that it's hard. It's hard to see our brothers and sisters falling off. But, what, but, the, but the, the prayer is just as effective as the correction. Why? Because God is always able to raise up someone to warn his children of what they must do. Amen. We have a word that says that God spoke through the mouth of a donkey and told the man what he must do. Amen. Hallelujah. God said that the people don't praise me, the rock will cry out. All of heaven and earth and nature belong to God and can respond to stop a brother or sister from their sin if God wants you to. So do you think that you're the only thing or you're the only person or you're the only one that has the righteousness of God that can correct someone. Who are you, my brother and my sister? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we have to respond to the spirit. Now, I don't want to scare nobody. If the spirit says go, go and don't hesitate because that person needs you. I think I told a testimony one time there was a brother. I happened to call him in the wee hours of the morning, but I knew that he worked early. So it was about 5.30 in the morning. I just happened to be up. I called the brother, and he was quiet, and he was weird. I said, what's going on? Praise the Lord, brother. He said, man. I said, what? He said, man, I just found a, um, an adult magazine, amen, and I was about to pick it up and open it. And right when I was about to pick it up and open it, you called. You never know when God says move, you have to move because you don't know what, he, what you're going to be able to do for someone. You may be the thing that helps someone be corrected. You may be the one that said, tells someone that says stop. But I ask my brother and my sister, discern between your own self and God's, between your own mind and the mind of God. Amen. Hallelujah. My third one, some of these things are obvious. Murder is a sin. So if someone commits murder, can we judge them? Good question, my brother and my sister. Amen. Did God share with you his mind about that person? 
Amen. In other words, what I'm saying is, do you know where that person is in the status of God? How do we know someone is repented? Amen. We see many of people through, through the body and out the body that act as if they repented. They act as if everything is good. They've never gone to God, amen, and turned their mind about that situation. They've never taken that sin, that iniquity, and given it to God. Amen. We cannot know, amen, a heart is repented or not. Only God can. So, yes, murder is sin, Absolutely. And if you don't repent, you'll go to hell. Absolutely. But how do we know when that person repented? Who are we to say, yeah, you really repented? Yeah, you really repented. I'm the measuring stick. I'm God's plumb line. I bumped Jesus off of the throne. I'm God's plumb line. Yeah, I'm the one that says whether you repented. I didn't like that because I didn't see no snot coming out your nose. You ain't really repented. Who are we? Amen. How can you know? You don't even know your own heart. The Bible says the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? You can't even know your own heart. How can you know your brother or sisters? Unless God give you a mind, amen, to be able to examine that person and come with the word. I hope somebody hears me this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Because this is critical. Amen. This is critical for us to be, amen, to be a body and be able to build each other up. Amen. Edification is necessary. Edification is how we do this thing. We come together in love to build each other up. Amen. But part of the building, as we spoke, I think I said it last week. Amen. You can't start to build unless you tear down the condemned building. You have to first get rid of all the rubble. And that's what the correction is. We got to get rid of the rubble. Absolutely. Before we can build on the foundation. Amen. Hallelujah. So there will be necessary for a man or woman that God will raise up with the word of correction but do not raise yourself up hallelujah because you may not want the consequences that come along with that hallelujah thank you Jesus let's get into this word amen second Timothy chapter 4 verses 8 thank you Jesus hallelujah and I don't have it on my screen I was about to yell at Titus boy what you doing amen Titus got the day off he deserves it he's been working hard uh, I'll be in new King James version all day if you have an electronic app amen thank you Jesus 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 8. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all those who love his appearing. And I really want to focus on this part right here, which the Lord, the righteous judge. Amen. Now, this is uh, Paul writing this, and Paul knew God. Matter of fact, the demons knew that Paul knew God. They said, uh, Jesus, Paul I know and Jesus I know, but who are you? The demons even knew Paul. Amen. That's how, uh, how in tune with the word of God and the righteousness of God. That's how he was operating in the, spirit, in the spirit. The demons were probably having meetings about, hey, if you run to this brother named Paul, run. Amen. Amen. Because he's operating in that power that God gave him. He's one of the few that tapped into that power. Amen. Hallelujah. We got power to do the same thing. Amen. That's another message. Amen. Amen. But Paul knew God very well. Amen. Paul was studied in the Old Testament. Amen. Before God set up judges, before God set up Moses to judge over the people, God was the righteous judge. And Paul knew these things. And so he says, which the Lord, the righteous judge. Now, pay attention to the, to the language and the way this sentence is built because it doesn't say the Lord, a righteous judge. It says the Lord, the righteous judge. And what do I point out? Because that there's only one righteous judge. Hope somebody understands me. There's only one righteous judge. There's not righteous judges. Amen. There is the righteous judge. Now, let's be uh, biblically accurate. God did set up men or women to judge over his people. Absolutely. Hallelujah. They did that under his power and his anointing that he, they would give, he would give them their mind to be able to execute his judgment. But the true judge, amen, the word, amen, the spirit all moved from the one righteous judge. The righteous judge. God has not given that authority to no other person on earth except by his spirit. Let me clear that up. We don't have a scripture that says that I'm a righteous judge and so is Pilate. I'm a righteous judge and so is Pope Francis. I'm a righteous judge and so is Donald Trump. Um, amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. God has not set up no other person. Not me. Not the pastor, the bishop, not one organ of any organization that exists. There's not a man on earth that could ever, hallelujah, be the righteous judge. Only God. That gives us a little bit of wisdom right there. If only God is the righteous judge, then do I really want to try to step in this place? 
Am, am I that sure of myself in my own righteousness that I could do the, God, the job just as good as, as God can? Do I really understand what he's asking, what he's calling, when he says he's fulfilled the law? Amen. When he's required us to remember the poor. Amen. When he's required us to give of the, uh, uh, to the widow. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And the single moms and the orphans. Amen. Do we really understand what he's saying? Amen. Do we really understand what it means to repent? We don't even understand the difference between the gift of the Holy Ghost and the gift of speaking in tongues. How can we understand the righteousness of God? Amen. We're still struggling with this thing about how to even explain it amongst the tongue talkers. How do we then say that we understand the righteousness of God in its absolute righteousness, undefiled, amen, hallelujah, and impartial, hallelujah, perfect in all of his ways? How can we understand that righteousness? I don't even know what I'm about to do in five minutes. How do I understand the righteousness of God? I couldn't even get the mind of God, the message he gave me last week. How can I understand the righteousness of God? Examine yourself. I'm putting my business out there. Examine yourself. How can you understand the righteousness of God? Think about what you did last week, what you did last month, the time you stumbled, the time you slipped up. You didn't pray for that brother. You didn't do this. You didn't move when God said you move. You bought the car you shouldn't. You rented the apartment you shouldn't have. But you want to judge someone else's soul? You want to have part in someone else's outcome in their eternity? Do you want that weight on you? There's one righteous judge. First Peter chapter one, verse 17. I'll give everybody a second. Hallelujah. First Peter chapter one, verse 17. Thank you, Jesus. And it reads, and if you call on the father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Amen. Amen. Where am I focusing again? Amen. And if you call on the Father without partiality, judges according to each one's work. Amen. Conduct yourself. Amen. Hallelujah. What is that scripture letting us to know? What, what is Peter saying? Amen. What Peter is saying, amen, is that God, our Father, the Creator, the Sustainer, amen, He's everything, amen, hallelujah, and everything is hinged on His own righteousness, amen. He judges without partiality. Thank you, Jesus. And I thought about this. Amen. We have biases. Do you not know that? If I have to judge between um, a black center and a white center, I, in, in my blackness, I may be more leaning on a black person, knowing what they're dealing with in the United States. This is me being honest. Honest. If I had to deal with um, judging, between, amen, be judging between Chris Staples and some brother from some other church, y'all know that's my little brother. I love him. Can I truly say that I gave God's exact judgment for that brother or that sister, knowing that I have a concern for them that goes, that appeals to my you know, humanity, my heart, amen, the same heart, amen, that's going to make a decision outside of God's will? Can I do this? We play favorites all day in the church. That's why James had a right about it. We play favorites with the person that's rich. We play uh, favorites with the person that looks the part. We play, we play favorites with the person that be uh, praying down heaven. We play favorites. Come on, come on, come on. Hallelujah. Then how can we say that I've judged without, uh, without partiality? It's a righteous judge, the same one God would have given. I'll be honest with y'all. I love y'all more than I love a stra uh, another brother in Christ that I don't know. I love all the body of Christ, but let's be real. I know y'all. I know your stories. I prayed for you and you prayed for me. We break, we've eaten bread together. We've cried together. We've shouted together. We've ran the aisles together. How would I not be partial to you? How would I not want your outcome to be more favorable? Amen. Hallelujah. Can the flesh make that decision? Or is that something that only God can make? And Peter is saying that God is the impartial, righteous God. Hallelujah. And so we have to be careful. Amen. Because our judgments could be skewed. Amen. By our very own humanity. Hallelujah. And this is why only God can do these things. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I'm moving right along. Matthew chapter seven. Amen. Thank you, Robin. Praise the Lord, Robin. I pray Joel is doing better. We pray for our brother. Amen. We're expecting a praise report. Amen. Matthew chapter seven, verses one through two. Here we go. Y'all know this. This is the words of Jesus himself. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, 
it will be measured back to you. Now, here we get into some wisdom of the saints. This is wisdom for you, my brother and my sister. Amen. Hallelujah. This is wisdom. And so we know that there's, there's judgments in the Bible. We know the scriptures judge, the, the oracles are judge, the morality of God judges. Amen. We've even talked about the caveat this morning. Amen. There's certain situations where we have to, between, we have to judge between a repentant sinner and an unrepentant sinner to know that how we should conduct ourselves with that brother or sister. Amen. There are certain situations, amen, where it's, where, where it's possible to judge. But this is the wisdom of Jesus, knowing the hearts of men and women. Amen. That their hearts were wicked. He says judge not that you be not judged now he doesn't say that for you to judge it's a sin so I want to be careful but this is wisdom of God this is the wisdom of Jesus why does he say that you should not judge amen because it's fine because if he says that this is this is how we know that it's permissible to judge because he says the judgment that you give is the one that can be measured now if it was unpermissible to, to judge then Jesus would have just said judge not uh, I command you to not judge but he says that judge not that you be not judged. But if you do, if you do, just know that the measure that you judge, that you put out there, is the same one I'm going to use for you. Hallelujah. 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 And so, I, and so what Jesus is telling us that you have to be wise, amen, about how you want to go forth in judgment. Do it if you will, if you're right, if you're in my will, if you're led by my spirit. But there's a danger, and that's why I have to warn you, that if you're judging, amen, incorrectly, if you're judging harshly, these things come back unto you. You let me know, amen, exactly where you are in your maturity by the way that you judge your brothers and sisters. And since you say that's where you are, that's where you'll be. That's how I'll judge with you. We don't let a brother or sister get away with an inch. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We don't let a brother or sister get away with inch. Amen. We're coming down on them. Oh, they shouldn't be doing this. They shouldn't do this. They're sin. Amen. They're backslidden. They done fell off. Amen. They're no good for the kingdom. So, okay. This is what God's saying. Okay. You're not going to give them no mercy? You won't even give them an inch? I'm going to give you a centimeter of, my, of, of mercy. You can't give your brother an inch, I'm giving you a centimeter. And now let me see you live up into your own requirement. Since you put yourself on the throne and you called yourself the righteous judge, and therefore you bumped me off of my authority, if you're God in your own way, amen, then I'll treat you according to my righteousness. If you want to be my equal, let me test you, let me try you, and let me see how you come forth. You are my spot. Okay, then you can have it. But I'll deal with you according to my 100% righteousness, not making any mercy since you don't give any mercy. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to let y'all know I'm so full of flaws. I'm giving out mercy like it's free candy. I'm giving out the, uh, mercy like government cheese at the church. Why? Because I know that I got mistakes. I got these thoughts that come into my mind. I can't control them. I beat them down. Hallelujah. And I rebuke them. But they keep popping up. These same old lyrics to these ungodly songs that I used to listen to. They keep coming up. These same old thoughts about things I've seen that I shouldn't see. I rebuke them and I have to cast them down. Hallelujah. But I still deal with them. Now, if I can't allow a brother or sister an inch, then what is God going to say for me when I'm begging for his mercy? Lord, I know in the middle of prayer I had that vision of that woman I shouldn't have. Lord, will you have mercy on me? Why would I if you didn't have mercy on that brother? Why would I? You're God. You have a own, your own heaven. Where is it? Who are you? You have your own heaven to put yourself into. You don't need me. You don't need my provisions. You don't care what I did on the cross. You don't care that I've died. You don't care that I got spit on. You don't care. Hallelujah. We, 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 we want to pass out judgment uh, 16 hours of the day. Amen. And then once a week for two seconds, we give mercy. How'd that happen? How does that come about? If God allows us to give mercy freely, why do we not give it more freely? James chapter 4, verse 12. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. James chapter 4, verse 12. There is one lawgiver, thank you, Jesus, who is able to save and to destroy. Here's the question. Who are you to judge? Thank you, Jesus. I think about Job. Where were you 
Huh. When I called the, 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 the water to not proceed the shoreline, where were you, amen, when I caused the trees to come out of the ground? Where were you where I formed the beast of the earth, amen, out of the ground? Where were you? Who are you? Where were you when I did this stuff? Did I consult with you? Do I need to? Do I, righteous God, need to submit unto you, my creation? There is one lawgiver. Because there can only be one that can give it. Why? Because there's only one that's righteous. Why? There's only one that's holy. Why? He's the only one that's able. Hallelujah. His name is one. Hallelujah. And we'll know him that way in eternity. It's only one lawgiver. It only could be one. There could only be one. Hallelujah. So God is holy and righteous and he alone is the judge. And there's no one that can sit on his bench. There's no one that can deceive him. Amen. There's not a U.S. Supreme Court justice. I don't care what court and what government. There's no one that could ever, amen, amen, examine the heart of a man or woman and make a righteous de de decision the way that our God can. Amen. Hallelujah. And the best thing about it, amen, is it's because it's his own form of justice. Amen. He can extend mercy whenever he wants. And when he could have gave us a sentence, a life sentence of eternity in hell, he instead sent his son. When he could have killed you and taken you out because you didn't believe him or you didn't trust him or you exalted another God. Amen. He sent his son. I'm specifically using he sent his son because it's all about his grace. It's the grace of God. It's the grace of God that we're here. It's his loving kindness. It's his willingness, amen, to suffer in the flesh as a man, hallelujah, full of sin for us. If it had not been for the Lord that was by my side, where would I be condemned and on my way to hell? And I was there at a point until God snatched me out. And you were there on a point until God snatched you out. And you were there until the point until God snatched you out. It was his love. It was his mercy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. Hallelujah. Monique, am I doing okay on time? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. New King James Version reads, And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite! I'm going to stop right there. One of the challenges, amen, of the Pharisees, and some of the leaders in the time was hypocrisy. They preached something and lived something different. They required the people of Israel to do something, and they did something different. Amen. Amen. They ruled with truth, but there was no mercy. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And so the hypocrite. And so when we look at this passage, amen, it's easy to really misunderstand what God is really saying right here. Now, my understanding, and maybe I was the only one, my understanding is I always looked at this passage to say that how can I call out, you know, the, let's just say, Chris, I'm sorry, I'm going to use you, brother, but I'm not speaking this, I rebuke this thought. Uh, Chris is over there gambling in the casino using all his rent money. Amen. And I'm judging him. Amen. But in the, in, in the meantime, I'm over here selling drugs and killing people, amen, to make my profit. I always looked at if it was like, how can you see this, this, sin, on, on, uh, this sin in a brother, but you're doing a whole different thing to a whole other degree. Now, but we have to include, amen, is, the, is God's way, way of thinking. Amen. The righteousness of God is different. God does not see sin the way we do. I don't know how we messed it up. We got our own scale of sin. We got classification of sins. All these things and theologians teach it. Amen. Well, God is just righteous and unrighteousness. And so when God is talking about a speck and a plank, he's not talking about one sin versus another. But what he is saying is that this person, amen, has is, is, is this amount of unrighteousness and you have a greater degree of unrighteousness. You're calling out everyone else not knowing exactly what their heart is or where they stand with me, thinking that they're un that they're unrighteous. But the true unrighteousness lies in you. It ain't about my sin versus your sin. It's just about the measure of unrighteousness within us. How do we call out the person that's failing just a little bit and say, man, we're failing a lot. And so this is what Jesus is saying. Amen. You, who are you to call out your unrighteousness? And why can't we have this wisdom? Now, this is 100 percent Isaac's opinion based on scripture. Amen. And I'll give it to you right here. Amen. Here's one thing that in my opinion, perhaps 
it is more harmful to incorrectly judge someone in sin than the sin in that person itself. It is more harmful or you and I, amen, to put an inaccurate judgment on someone than the sin that they have within themselves. This is my opinion. Amen. And what am I saying about that? We just never know exactly what God is doing for a person. We don't know the state that they're in. We don't know where God has brought them from and has taken them to. We don't know the trials and tribulations that they're going to go through. God knows the end from the beginning. And so when we pass an inaccurate judgment, amen, in our own limited thinking, in our own limited understanding, we don't, we don't know what's going to, we don't, we can't even remember what happened yesterday. God knows yesterday just as good as he knows tomorrow. And therefore, amen, what he's doing in a man or woman's life is his prerogative and he's perfect in what he's going to do. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to try to make more sense out of that. I'll be wrapping up here pretty quickly. Amen. Romans, and I'm going through these scriptures quickly. This ain't a deep dive into one passage. I'm trying to give you line upon line and precept upon precept. Uh, I know some of you take notes and read it back. Amen. If I'm wrong, come on, correct me, please. Amen. Because I ain't trying to miss heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. But I also ask you to examine yourself against this word first and then come back and let's talk about it. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 14, verses 10 through 13. I'm going to move quickly. Amen. Because I got some stuff that has to has to be said today. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Romans chapter verses uh, chapter 14, verses 10 to 3. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? That's disappointment, being mad, upset with them, angry. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So that each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this or let's do this or have this conclusion not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in your brother's way. This is the point I was just trying to make. Amen. Amen. Your inaccurate judgment, hey, my, my brother, my sister, you tell that brother or sister in your mind and understanding you actually this is where church hurt comes from. This is it. This is the core of it right here. Amen. I see brother stuff. They're not doing what I think they should be doing. Amen. They shouldn't be coming to church with them shorts and flip flops. Amen. They shouldn't be doing this. Amen. Amen. I'm going to condemn them. You know better to come to the house of the Lord like this. All these things we do. Amen. Y'all know the stories just as well as I do. We've all been there and I've done it myself. I remember a brother came to Peace Apostolic wearing a hat and I wanted to get out of my seat and escort that brother out to church. How dare I? How dare I? Where else can he go? Amen. But to come here to church at a church that's preaching the truth, preaching the truth. Amen. Come on in your hat and your flip flops and your shorts because I believe this is the place where you can hear the word of God and be changed. But we create a stumbling block when we put these judgments on people saying that they should do this and they should do this when God has not given that to us to tell them. And so Peter is saying this stuff is getting out of control. You calling this person? You on Facebook, Instagram, talking about this person, saying this person should do this and shouldn't be doing this? This is getting out of hand because ain't none of y'all living right in yourself. And I know this because you're so stuck in this judgment. It's the measuring stick that I can see that you're not being led by the Holy Ghost. Your judgment says everything for me. Your judgment says everything. It says you're stuck in your flesh. And that's why you've gotten that authority or audacity to even, to even tell somebody, amen, what you think they should be doing or shouldn't be doing. And this becomes a stumbling block. And this causes many of us to leave the church for a season. Some never come back. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where else would they go? Where else would they go? That's why you're here, and that's why you were there. It's a hospital. How are you going to deny their claim? Just because you got a broken ankle, you can't deny the person with the flu. Just because you got hepatitis, you can't, uh, you can't deny the person with HIV. It's a hospital. We all come here to be healed. You can't deny me my bed. You're not the righteous physician. Let me up in here because this is where I need to be. This is where I need to be. Make room for me. Hallelujah. Let me share your hospital bed with you. Amen. Hallelujah. You got two to tubes. Give me one of them because I need it too. You dealing with a different problem and I'm dealing with a problem. But we'll come together between the righteous physician to be healed. 
There is a bomb in Gilead. His name is Jesus. His Holy Ghost. Amen. You got to be at a church that's preaching in the spirit. Where else would he go? You can't be healed without the spirit. You can't be healed without the bomb. There's no healing outside of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But we know there's a day that we'll all be judged for the account of the, for the deeds in our body. And there's things that we've all done. We've, we've repented. Some things we didn't realize were sin. Some things we just didn't know. We're asking for God's mercy for those things. Amen. That way I messed up. Amen. That thing that I did, I said some things when I thought I was a Muslim that I'm, certain, I'm concerned about. I don't know if it was blasphemy. I don't know. I'm asking God to forgive me anyhow. I'm asking God when I get to the pearly gates, amen, that he'll have mercy on me because I didn't know better. I really didn't know him like that. All the things that I thought, amen, all the things that come to my mind, the viola I violated and defiled women. I just pray that the Lord will heal them and heal me and have mercy on me. God has a case to send me to hell right now. He is just, amen, and it will be just for God to send all of us to hell. Right now, all of us. Matter of fact, let me rebuke myself. I'm not going to judge you that way. I'll speak for myself. I know me. I know what I've done. I know this wicked heart of mine. God has a case against me and a charge against me. Hallelujah. But I love what Peter, what, what Paul says, amen, amen, is that God is looking at us individually according to our very unique and specific situation. Hallelujah. Montrese, I don't know you like that. It, it, Linda, is Charles listening? I'm close to Charles. I don't know you like that. I'm very close to my brother Lorenzo. I think he's on here, but I don't know you like that. Me and Chris have very intimate conversations, um, just as intimate as anyone I have. But Chris, I don't know you like that. I'm praying for, praying for wisdom in our relationship that I can be fruitful, and we can be fruitful one into another, and that we can be profitable to the kingdom. But only God knows exactly what's going to happen to a man or woman. I looked over at my wife. I know my wife pretty good. Amen. I don't know her like that. God knows her like that. And this walk is individual. This walk is individual. We are in fellowship together. Amen. Maybe some of us don't make it. I pray that's not the case. Amen. Hallelujah. But God knows every single individual heart and every single individual circumstance, and he's willing to judge us individually. He doesn't take, amen, his ruler. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And put it against all of us. When I gave the, I hope everybody got that example of the plumb line. Amen. Now we know that the Holy Ghost is the plumb line. Is hallelujah. What happens is you can take a plumb line and attach it to any old thing. It's always going to give you, amen, a perpendicular mark into the foundation. It's always going to point to the righteousness of God. It don't matter. Amen. Hallelujah. What you've done, Montrese, and what you've done, Christina. Amen. That the Holy Ghost, amen, hallelujah, God's plumb line is able to take you exactly where you are and get you to where you need to be that's his mercy that's his mercy it's individual and it's renewed every single day he didn't do that in times past you were just out of here brother you didn't make it you continued in sin you didn't bring your, 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 your bull on the day of atonement therefore your sins are not forgiven and you're left to your flesh we're kicking you out of the village and you're out in the wilderness amen hallelujah it was done. It was done. God is working with us. And Paul is warning us here, don't judge because you just don't want to be caught up in that. You don't want to be a stumbling block to your brother or your sister. Amen. First Peter chapter 4, verses 8. I'm going to close in one second because I believe, Lord, we've heard enough. I'm going I'm to I'm record with the words of, close with the words of Jesus. But uh, first I'm going to go for First Peter 4, 8. Amen. The words of Peter. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. I used, Hallelujah. I used to hide from this scripture. I would look at this scripture and I'd keep on reading right past it. I didn't understand it. What does that make, make That doesn't make sense, God. You said that we had to repent and be baptized, amen, for the forgiveness of the sins. You said that it was your finishing work on the cross, amen, that we could confess our sins and you would forgive us. But this verse says something slightly different. It says, above all, amen, fervent love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. 
And this may be one of the part, one of the one of the one of the ways that we can impact our outcome. Hallelujah. Is that we can take part in the love of God, giving mercy one to another, showing love one to another. Amen. To cover our very own sins. Hallelujah. That 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 shakes the core of my my apple. That that shakes my my immature foundation in the Holy Ghost. I, I didn't understand that. But the scripture and the word is what it is. Amen. Hallelujah. There's something, amen, that God is willing to overlook. Amen. If we are able to abound in his love. And why? Because his love actually makes us like him. Amen. Jesus said that the whole law, amen, and the, and the old and the prophets are summed up into these things. Love your Lord, the, uh, your God, the, the Lord your God with all your heart, strength, and soul. The second one is just like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. So, my brother and my sister, you got a bunch of sins. You've asked for forgiveness, but you're still concerned about the mercy that God's going to have you. Amen. Do you feed yourself? Then feed your brother. Do you pray for yourself? Then pray for your brother. Do you give yourself money? Then give your brother or sister money. Do you forgive yourself? Amen. Some of y'all don't. You should. Do you forgive yourself? Then forgive your brother. Hallelujah. I didn't understand that. Amen. Because I knew that in the context of what he's saying. Amen. That the love of God is in Christ Jesus. And so the first perspective I ever had is that when he read, when Paul, when Peter says this, he's saying that the love of God, the work that he did, the finishing work on the cross. Amen. Is what covers the sins. But if you read this same passage, and I'm not going to read it today, if you read verses through 9-11, I believe it's the proper context of what he's saying. In verses 9-11, through 11, Peter starts to talk about these ways that we serve one another in the body, these things that we do. Amen. Amen. And because of the contextual awareness, I have to say that it truly is. Amen. The way that we serve one another, the way that we operate with another, the things that we do for another will cover our own sins. They will earn us mercy at the final judgment. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And I'm going to close because I'm out of it, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I've given you every bit of me. I'm going to close with this passage, and we'll, we'll go to prayer. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 48. It's a long read. Luke chapter 7. Verses 36 through 48. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 48. This is Jesus here. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, here, a woman who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to him, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know, uh, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Now, remember, amen, verse 39 says, he said this to himself. Verse 40. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since, I came, I, since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Ooh, Jesus, hallelujah. We don't understand. We still don't understand the love of God 
And God has allowed us to be able to love and show mercy one to another. Hallelujah. But somehow we've become experts at judgment. And I just want to warn everybody today. Amen. Be careful of your judgments. Make sure they come from God. They could damage you more than they do good. And I'll say to uh, as well, likely as important, be free with your mercy. Be free with your mercy. Give it away when you don't think people deserve it. Give it away when you don't think they even repent it. Give it away because you have it to give. I think about the rich man, amen, when he went to hell and he said, please tell my brothers about this place because it's so awful that there's no way that I can have them go there. And this is why I start to wonder, do we really believe that there's a hell? Because we know that if our brother and sisters is unrepented in sin, that's where they're going. Why would we not beg for God's mercy and forgiveness for them? We'd rather them stay condemned. We'd rather them stay in their sin. It makes us feel better about ourselves to know that we're not the biggest sinner. But because you thought that you are the biggest sinner. We got to give mercy freely. It's the one thing that God has given us that's just like him that we can operate in. I said it uh, months ago. The closest we ever get to being like God is giving mercy. That's the closest you'll ever be to being like, you think you're speaking in tongues? That's nothing. God don't speak in tongues. Hear that. God don't speak in tongues. He don't need no confirmation of his spirit. He is that spirit. We think the closest we get to God, I'm, I was on my knees at the altar. I was speaking in tongues. It was just me and God. Amen. Well, I'm glad you're doing that. That's wonderful. God is interceding for you. But the closest, my brother and my sister, that you ever get to being like God is in, the, in, is in mercy and forgiveness. And I, I'll close with that. I just want to I beg somebody to repent today. Amen. One of my brothers or sisters, one of my self-righteous brothers or sisters, I beg for you. Amen. First to repent today. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I beg for you to repent today. Amen. Amen. For all of us. And I've started. I'll start with myself. Lord, forgive me for those times that I, that I was judgmental to someone. Amen. When I condemned them, when I said they were no good, they couldn't be saved and they couldn't come back. That thing they did. Amen. Amen. Well, ha, glory. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. I repent, Lord, right now for those times and ask for your mercy upon me, Lord God, in my foolishness. Hallelujah. Forgive me, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 